Welcome to the Waking Up Podcast. This is Sam Harris. Well, I launched the survey that I spoke about in a previous episode to get a sense of how a live podcast tour might be designed. And I'm very glad I did that because I got a lot of valuable information. And the upshot is that I don't think a tour is a good idea because it really won't serve the purpose I intended. My original goal, if you recall, was to do something good for the people who are supporting the podcast. But here is what I discovered after doing this survey. The first thing is that even if I did a 20-city tour, I was planning 10, but even if I doubled that, nearly half the people who are supporting the podcast still live somewhere else. And many, understandably, found it very frustrating to know that I wouldn't be coming anywhere near where they live. So a tour twice the size of the one I was planning would leave out nearly half of the very people I was hoping to reach. Another thing I learned from the survey is that people find the economics of such tours fairly off-putting. Now, the, the economics are pretty surprising. They definitely surprised me. But when you add the rental of the auditoriums and the cost of travel and insurance and event planners and security and logistics and staging and AV, it all adds up. And the economics are these. It would take a $100 ticket, on average, to cover the costs of the tour. Okay, and that's definitely more than I'm comfortable with. But the survey revealed that most people assumed I would be making a fortune at that ticket price, when the reality is that I would need to sell out 1,000-seat auditoriums in every city just to break even. Now, we looked at what it would take to bring the general ticket price down to, say, $30, but it just isn't possible. Normally, when you go to an event that costs $20 or $30, someone has sponsored it or it's part of an endowed lecture series, or the inviting organization owns the theater, or they're also holding a VIP event for $300 a person, or some combination of these things. But for a variety of reasons, those options don't work for me for a tour like this. Now again, this whole idea was born of my wanting to do something good for everyone who's supporting the podcast, and I still want to do that, so I've decided to rethink this, I'm still going to make sure that supporters get early access to tickets to speaking events that I do whenever they come up. And this includes the event I'm doing in Vancouver in November. But instead of a tour, I've decided to create exclusive content for podcast supporters, which is what many of you have requested. Now, I've resisted that idea in the past because I didn't especially like limiting access to my podcast content. However, putting something online is really the only way that all supporters can have an opportunity to hear it. And it will reach people whether they're giving 50 cents an episode or $50. And that's really much more in line with the way I want this to feel. It was no fun reading comments from people who felt excluded because they couldn't afford an expensive ticket. That's not at all the feeling I was hoping to spread. So from now on, my Ask Me Anything episodes will be done exclusively for supporters of the podcast. And your level of support is totally immaterial. We've created a mechanism by which you can ask me questions on my website. And I'll reach out to everyone by email soon with the relevant information. Anyway, I really want to thank all of you who took the time to offer your feedback. 12,000 of you answered the survey in the first few hours. And once I saw the data coming in, I knew it was time to correct course almost immediately. So I suspect that won't be the last time I hit you with a survey. Thank you again for that. And now for today's guest. I love this interview. My guest today is Timothy Snyder. Timothy Snyder is a professor of history at Yale University and a permanent fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna. He received his doctorate from the University of Oxford, where he was a Marshall Scholar. Before joining the faculty at Yale in 2001, he held fellowships in Paris, Vienna, and Warsaw, and an academy scholarship at Harvard. He has spent some 10 years in Europe and speaks five and reads ten European languages. He's also written for the New York Review of Books, Foreign Affairs, The Times Literary Supplement, The Nation, and The New Republic, as well as for the New York Times, the International Herald Tribune, the Wall Street Journal, and other newspapers. He is a member of the Committee on Conscience of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, and he's the author of several award-winning books, including The Red Prince, Bloodlands, Europe Between Hitler and Stalin, and Black Earth, The Holocaust as History and Warning. His latest book, On Tyranny, 20 Lessons from the 20th Century, which is what we focused on, 
is currently number one on the New York Times bestseller list for nonfiction in paperback. As you'll hear, this is a timely conversation, but please take my early admonishments about the, the nonpartisan nature of this conversation for what they are. We do talk a lot about Trump, but whether or not Trump is actually an example of Snyder's thesis can definitely be held to one side. You'll figure out what I think about that by the end, but it's actually not the core of the conversation. And now I give you Timothy Snyder. I am here with Timothy Snyder. Timothy, thanks for coming on the podcast. My pleasure. You have written this beautiful little book on tyranny. When did you write this? Because this is so, it's, it's a very short book. I'm a huge fan of short books now, both as a reader and as a writer. Most books are far too long. Certainly, argument-driven books tend to be far too long because the dirty little secret about publishing is that publishers haven't figured out how to publish short books and still make enough of a profit. A 300-page book could be 60 pages in many cases, but to publish a 60-page book just is not a profitable enterprise. But anyway, you've written a very short book on tyranny, 20 Lessons from the 20th Century. I just want to move through this book fairly systematically, but when did you write it? Because this reads as something you wrote the, the moment Trump became president. When did you actually start typing? So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to give you a slightly pompous historian's answer and maybe defend publishers a little bit too. Uh, it's true that I wrote it very quickly, but it was a compression of longer spans of time, right? So it's a compression of the, the history of the 20th century, which in turn I've spent 25 years trying to understand. And along the way, many years have been invested very pleasantly in friendships with people who have lived through communism and sometimes fascism. And then fewer years, but still more than I'd like to admit, with, with students from Eastern Europe who themselves have lived through um, the failed promise of democracy and who have learned about resistance or relearned about it. And I've, I've tried to learn from them. So yeah, I'll tell you when I wrote the book and how quickly I wrote the book, but it's as though all these layers of time are, are simultaneously present. I couldn't have just sat down and written the thing without all of that previous time weighing down on me. What I was trying to do was to convert all of that into a format that would be immediately useful. So yeah, I, I mean, I, I wrote the 20 lessons um, in, in, a, in a few hours after the election. And then the book I wrote in, in December in, in a few days. Um, but in, in a way like that itself demonstrates one of the points of the book, which is that we are in a critical moment where we don't have very much time. And so whatever was going to make a difference had to appear immediately at the very beginning. And I'm not sure that my press, in fact, I'm sure that my press hasn't solved the problem of how to make money out of a short book. I don't think they're making any money. Um, but what they did do was join in this venture very enthusiastically. And, and for that, I'm, I'm really appreciative. Oh, yeah. No, it's fantastic. And so you, you have 20 lessons here, and maybe we'll just get through the first 10 or so. But I just want to make it clear that, you know, I don't view this conversation as a surrogate for someone buying the book, no matter how comprehensive we seem to be in talking about it. And this is, this can be generically said of the conversations I have with most authors, I, I try to not put people in competition with the free versions of themselves that exist online. I want people to buy people's books. But in this case, this really is just such a satisfying read. So I just want to make it clear that our listeners should buy this book and read it. You can read it in an hour. You can probably read it more quickly then we will have this conversation. But first of all, your writing is so wonderful and so lapidary and aphoristic that it's, it's a pleasure to read. And I'll read a few pieces from it as we talk here. One criticism of this book, and we'll get into this and people will get a sense of just how worried you can sound about our current moment in history. One criticism is that it exaggerates the danger of Trump. And I'm wondering how you feel the book is aging over the first few months of, of the Trump presidency. Is there anything that has reassured you, or are you, are you exactly where you were when you, when you hit send to your publisher? 
So, I mean, l- let me again take a slightly different angle on that. The whole point of the book is that we have to spread out our political imagination and have a broader sense of what's possible. And that the, the danger precisely is that we just go day by day and then every day seems normal. Even if, you know, today is much worse than yesterday, we're very good at getting used to today. And then tomorrow the same thing happens. So I, I didn't write the book, in fact, directly about Trump, although it is striking, and I'll start to answer your question, it is striking how um, many of the things I wrote about actually have happened in, in the meantime. I, I wrote the book more for us. It was clear from 2016 that we were dealing with a candidate who didn't respect basic American institutions like the rule of law or democracy. It was clear that we were dealing with a man who was not tolerant, to put it very mildly, and who had a certain vision about how things should be run, which was not consistent with checks and balances or institutional constraints. It was clear that we had a man whose political heroes were foreign dictators who had precisely done away with the rule of law after being elected. So the, the, it, the, the question is not really so much Trump. The question is us. I mean, what happens in these situations is a person with the kind of character that he has who finds himself in an institutional situation that constrains him will push against those constraints. He can't really do anything else. That, that's who he is. And so the the relevant question is more, can those constraints hold him? And um, even more to the point, what can we do to make sure those constraints hold him? That's that's what the book is really about. So, I mean, when I first posted the 20 lessons, there were a lot of people who thought that I was going overboard. But I have to say, as time has gone past, that has ceased to be a major reaction. And, And the more dominant reaction has been, hmm, how did you see this coming? And the 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 simple answer is that history, you know, doesn't repeat, but history gives you a much broader palette of what's possible. And the point of the book is not to go point by point and hit off particular things that Trump will do, so much as to prepare ourselves to do a whole bunch of different things, which make an authoritarian regime change less likely. So, yeah, I mean, some things people have done, I've been reassured by, I've been reassured by lawyers filing briefs in advance. I've been reassured by the, the spontaneous protests at airports. I've been reassured by the marches. I've been reassured by the new non-governmental organizations that didn't exist before. I've been I've been reassured by uh, the the civic mindedness and patriotism of some of our some of our civil servants. I've been reassured by the investigative journalism, especially investigative print journalism at the Washington Post. But on the other side, we have we have plenty of people who don't see that there's a problem at all. We have plenty of people who are doing the normal human thing of just normalizing the situation and basically taking whatever they're given from day to day. So. But my fundamental reaction about, you know, the notion that I'm exaggerating is Americans are super provincial. We, we, we don't really have a sense of what's possible because we've been lucky. We, we overestimate how much we deserve what we get, and we underestimate how, much, how we can just simply get unlucky. At the moment, we're unlucky, um, which means that at the moment, we, more is demanded of us than would otherwise be the case. Yeah, I don't want people to get the wrong sense of the connection between your book and this current moment, because again, it does read not as narrowly focused on Trump, but you're talking about how democracies can fail and how people can not realize that they are being pulled by the tide of history in a very unlucky direction with great consequence. So we're going to get into this specifically now and and talk about your points. Even if you were wrong about Trump, you know, if, if Trump just has a stroke tomorrow and becomes magically the perfect president, the generic case still holds. If not Trump, then someone. And, and, and the election of Trump has proven to many of us, certainly all of us who are alarmed by it, that our system is vulnerable to a demagogue in a way that many of us haven't anticipated. And it's scary for me to imagine someone much more competent than Trump and much more ideological, much more nefarious, but who can find the loophole in our system the way Trump did and come to power. And so I don't want to give people the wrong sense that this is narrowly focused on Trump. And you you handle it beautifully because you, you may mention his name once in here, but you generally just refer to the president, which I thought was was very artful. And the book will age well. This is not a book that five years from now is, is going to read like a magazine article. I want to pick up on the point you just raised about how provincial Americans are. And you say here in the beginning, 
Americans today are no wiser than the Europeans who saw democracy yield to fascism, Nazism, or communism in the 20th century. And then you say, well, one advantage is that we might learn from their experience. Now is a good time to do so. Why are we so blinkered? Yeah, thank you for putting the question so, so baldly, because it's a, it's, a really, it's a really important one. Uh, if we're going to get out of this mess, we're going to have to notice some of our weaknesses. We, we've gotten into the habit of congratulating ourselves on our strengths. And um, this is what this is, this is a ritual that both Democrats and Republicans engage in in their in their different ways. I think it was one of the weaknesses of of Obama rhetoric, for example, that we were constantly got into the habit of telling ourselves how good we were at certain things. I think there there you know there are three things at play here. The first is the longstanding um, religious uh, tradition of exceptionalism, the notion that. Americans were escaping a world of evil into into a pure world, um, which is, of course, I mean, ridiculous on a whole number of fronts, but it's there as a tradition. The, the second is, is the obvious fact that we are in many ways a world unto ourselves. And so um, people who work on American history rarely venture beyond American history. So it's a lot to expect that the American citizen could do could do better. And the third thing, and maybe the most relevant, is that um, in a move which I think is going to be remembered as as one of metaphysical laziness, we decided after 1989 that history was was over, and therefore we disarmed ourselves um, against the very threats which history ought to have been reminding us of, and we prevented ourselves from seeing some of the weaknesses in our in our own system. Um, so after 18, 1989, I mentioned 1989 because that's the year when communism came to an end. Of course, after that, many of us got ourselves worked into various versions of a story whereby human nature would lead to a market which would lead to democracy and enlightenment, which would lead to peace or something like that, um, which is basically a historical nonsense. I mean, there are more left-wing versions of this as well, but all of these theological stories are, are basically wrong. History is always going to be full of surprises and structural forces that we don't anticipate um, and accidents. And, it, and the very fact of claiming that history is over is itself a historical choice. It's a, it's a historical choice to be ignorant, to forget the concepts which were once useful, and it's a historical choice to be vulnerable when, when threats start to seep up on you again. That's, that's what's happened to us. You know, that was part of the perfect storm of 2016, is that it happened a full generation after 1989. In a way, it was, it's the payback for deciding that history was over. Um, that's, that's part of what happened. And you describe fascism and communism both as responses to globalization. And this antipathy for globalization obviously played an important role in the 2016 election. Talk about that a little bit. How is a recoil from the world responsible for these anti-democratic tendencies? Th thanks for bringing that up, because that's, that's, that's an important part of the answer to some of your other really good questions. So if we just take a step back and think about globalization itself, that concept is, is a good example of how we're, we're trapped in a present and have trouble seeing the past. The whole paradigm of globalization, as, as we've invented it for ourselves in the 21st century, assumes that it's something new. And when you assume that something is new, then you don't see that it has arc, you don't see that it has patterns, you don't learn where it might be going. And the basic fact, and this is one of the things that historians bang their foreheads against the table about, the basic fact is that this is the second globalization. There was a very similar movement in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. We had the same expansion of, of foreign trade, we had the same export-driven growth. And interestingly, maybe most interestingly, in the late 19th century, we had much the same thing as we had in the late 20th century. We had the idea that these expansions of trade would inevitably lead to expansions of consciousness um, and that universal ideas would inevitably triumph. So we've been down this road before. This is the intellectual history of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And that, that globalization um, ends in, as we all know, the First World War, the Great Depression, and, and the Second World War. So the, the, the whole point of, of remembering this is to be braced. On the one hand, to be braced, by re, be braced in the sense of being sobered up, realizing that globalization can also go in these ways, that we shouldn't be surprised that there are react, contradictions in it and reactions to it, and that some of them can be quite extreme. Um, but it's also bracing in the sense that it reminds us that there are people who lived through this the first time around who are perhaps um, not only more experienced than we are because they came out the other end of it, they survived, um, but but more articulate and perhaps wiser than we are. And we can we can we can save a lot of time by drawing on what they left behind, which is which is the point of the book. But anyway, that's just all prologue to, to, to trying to answer your question. 
it's natural that globalization is going to bring, even if it brings an average improvement in some kind of abstract notion of well-being, like GDP per capita, that it's going to also produce local or fractally local inequalities, and it's going to produce various kinds of resentments because globalization also is the globalization of comparison. It means that people compare themselves to other people in ways that they hadn't done before and can often subjectively feel themselves to be the victims, whether or not they are objectively. That's clearly happened in the United States in the 21st century. Um, something similar happened in the middle of Europe in the, in the early 20th century. And in that environment, it's very easy then for clever politicians to come around and say, look, globalization is not complicated. It's actually simple. It's not a, it's not a multi-vector challenge. It's, it's actually a conspiracy. I will put a face on globalization for you. And the way that fascism and national socialism worked was usually to put a Jewish face on globalization and to say, look, all these problems are not the result of an, an unhindered process, which nobody controls completely, but they're actually a result of a particular conspiracy of a particular group. That's very powerfully powerful politically, because then you can get your hands on, figuratively and literally, you can get your hands on members of that group who are inside your country, and you can imagine that you're carrying out some kind of political change. So. Similarly, although, you know, in, in a minor key, if we think about the U.S. in the 21st century, if you think about the campaign now, the presidency of Donald Trump, you see, uh, uh, you see basically the same reaction to globalization. The, the problem is not that the United States can't control everything. The problem is not that globalization is always going to be full of challenges, which we need to actually face and try to address. The problem is not that we need to have state policy. No, 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 says Mr. Trump. The problem is that globalization has a face. It has a Chinese face. It has a Mexican face. It has a Jewish face. Um, and and, and that, that is a familiar form of politics because what that does is it relieves Mr. Trump um, and the government in general of any obligation of actually addressing the challenges of globalization. And instead, it replaces that with a form of politics in which we are, we are meant to just chase after the, the, supposed, uh, the supposed members of these various groups um, and while we do that, then we forget about what the government is supposed to be doing for us, namely making us more prosperous. So the, the, the attempt at a Muslim ban is terrible for Muslims, but it's not really about Muslims. It's about getting us into the habit of seeing Muslims as, sor as a source of our problems. The new denunciation office at Homeland Security, where you're supposed to call up a bureaucrat in Washington if you think you've been a victim of a crime um, by an undocumented migrant. That's not about the migrants. It's about getting you into the habit of, de of denouncing your neighbors. It's about bringing in a new form of politics. So. This is how anti-globalization politics works. It's you, you give up, you say, we can't handle it. We, we don't have the strength to deal with this. We're going we're gonna to personalize it all. And that, that, is, that, that changes politics inside the country in ways that we're starting to see. Well, when you say, when you put it that way, when you say it's not about undocumented migrants, it's about ushering in a new kind of politics, right, where, where you have people informing on their neighbors, that seems to attribute some kind of nefarious intention or agency on the part of people who are currently in government. It's not a, a system working unconsciously in this direction. This is people, and correct me if I'm wrong, it sounds like you are alleging that people are having consciously undemocratic thoughts, whether we want to call them fascistic or, or some other flavor of edging toward tyranny. We, we can table that for a second. Yes, we, we do have people in the White House, such as Mr. Bannon, who are quite consciously ideological and think in, in far-right traditions that are anti-democratic. We, we have a president of the United States um, who spent 2016 telling us that democracy is basically faked, which is one of the things that people say in the first stages of regime changes. When it comes to denunciation, I think people half understand what they're doing, and then when it happens, they take, they take the next step, whether it's the administration or whether it's the citizens doing the denouncing. You, you cross a certain moral threshold when you do it, but if you denounce somebody, you get praised for doing it, and then maybe you get the first crack at their property or whatever might follow, and then, and then a new cycle begins. So yes, I would, say, I would say quite clearly there are people who do have what you're calling anti-democratic thoughts. Absolutely. Part of the whole point of history is to recognize that democracy is not automatic and there are plenty of people who don't like it. And But also there are these processes by which both civil servants and citizens get drawn in and then find themselves in a different moral place afterwards, even if they didn't completely understand what they were doing at the beginning. Yeah. 
Yeah, okay. Well, I want to get directly into your book and into the the lessons. I just want some of this language inserted into the conversation. The first lesson is do not obey in advance. And then you have these summaries before each chapter. Most of the power of authoritarianism is freely given. In times like these, individuals think ahead about what a more repressive government will want and then offer themselves without being asked. A citizen who adapts in this way is teaching power what it can do. And then you, give it, you, you talk about how the Nazis moved into Austria and how really the behavior of the Austrians, more or less unbidden, taught the Nazis how far they could go in victimizing the Jews. And just you seem to suggest that this was, there was something to learn from how readily people acquiesced to this project. Yeah, so thank you. So uh, number, that's lesson number one, don't obey in advance. And it's, it's number one for, for a bunch of reasons. One, as you suggest, it is right at the core of what historians think we understand about authoritarian regime changes, Nazi Germany in particular, but also in general. Namely that at the very beginning, whether it's the takeover in Germany itself or whether it's the, the Anschluss in Austria, at the very beginning, authoritarian leaders require consent. This is a really important thought because when we think of um, you know, authoritarians, we then think of villains and then we think of supervillains, then we think of superpowers. You know, we imagine these guys in uniforms who can just stride across the stage of history and do whatever they want. And maybe towards the end, something like that is true, but at the beginning, it's not. At the beginning, interestingly, people have, in a sense, more power than they do normally because they also have, they have the power to resist. The problem is that we don't usually realize that. The problem is that we tend as human beings to take new situations as normal and then to align ourselves with them. Our little, our little needle compasses look for the new, you know, look for the new true north and align ourselves to it. We just, we follow along, we drift. And most of the time that's appropriate, but sometimes it's an, it's an absolute disaster. So, you know, historians generally agree about that which is notable because historians, particularly historians of Nazi Germany, don't all always agree about everything, to put it mildly. The other reason it's at the front of the book is that if you blow it, if you blow number one, then you can forget about the rest. Because if you, if you can't do don't obey in advance, which is harder than it sounds, if you can't do that, then the rest of them become, will become impossible because the rest of them will seem psychologically senseless to you. If you fail not to obey in advance, if instead you normalize and you drift, then the rest of it won't make any sense to you because you'll already be drifting things which had seen which would have seemed abnormal to an earlier version of you will start to seem normal now the 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 point to start doing anything will never seem to come you'll keep saying tomorrow 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 in fact you'll just be internally adjusting 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 and psychologically you become a different person and then the the final reason why that's lesson number 1 is political if people, if people uh, don't take advantage of the moment they have in the first weeks, months, and maybe at the outside the first year, if you don't do anything then, then the system changes and the costs of resistance become much, much higher. So right now, like the little things that we do that would make a difference, like looking people in the eye, subscribing to newspapers, making small talk, founding a neighborhood organization, running for local office, protesting, having political conversations like the one you and I are having, at the moment, these things require just a tiny bit of courage, right? Not, not very much. But later, when, the, when these things start to become illegal or even dangerous, they require much more courage. So politically, you have to get out front and do these things, even if you're not sure exactly what you're holding off. You have to do these things at, at the beginning. So yeah, I mean, I bring up these examples, as, as you rightly say, 1938 in Austria, because they really powerfully convey this dynamic. Hitler did not know. Um, that he could absorb Austria in a few days. He did it because of the messages he got from below. Austrian Jews did not know they were in such they were in such a position of threat. They found out because of how people reacted to the arrival of of German force. The, these actions that the population chooses or doesn't choose to take at the beginning are are really crucial to authoritarianism. It means that we have power. It also means that we have responsibility. It means that you don't have the option of doing nothing. In America, in spring of 2017, if you're doing nothing, you're actually doing something. If you're doing nothing, you're helping a regime change come about. So I want to flag the reaction that I, I know is occurring in some percentage of our listeners, which is that 
everything you just said when mapped onto the present sounds like a symptom of paranoia, right? That this is just like, we're not, we're fundamentally not in the situation we just described. And we can remain somewhat agnostic about that. I mean, I, I'm, I can't name a person really now who is, who is more critical of Trump than I am. To some percentage of my, my listeners, I have completely lost my mind on this point. But I want to try to maintain what will be viewed as a less partisan line through this conversation, because everything you're saying here generically applies. Again, if not now, sometime this applies. And certainly, you know, you and I are going to be in large agreement about how much we should be taking seriously these concerns right now, given what has happened in the White House. But again, this is not, even if you're a fan of Trump, these dynamics are in play potentially everywhere all the time, no matter how stable your democracy seems. It's vulnerable to this kind of thing. So I want to move to point two, which is defend institutions. And you say that institutions do not protect themselves. They fall one after the other unless each is defended from the beginning. And then you, you use Nazi Germany as an example. And then you quote from an editorial that I had never read. I've, I've read a lot about the Holocaust. I had never seen an editorial like this. And this was, a, was written in a newspaper for German Jews. And this is the editorial from the newspaper. This is the, the editorial's position. So imagine, you know, the New York Times writing an editorial like this in 1933 on the eve of the decade that would usher in the, the final solution. This is the perspective of German Jews in 1933. We do not subscribe to the view that Mr. Hitler and his friends, now finally in possession of the power that they have so long desired, will implement the proposals circulating in Nazi newspapers. They will not suddenly deprive German Jews of their constitutional rights, nor enclose them in ghettos, nor subject them to the jealous and murderous impulses of the mob. They cannot do this, because a number of crucial factors hold powers in check, and they clearly do not want to go down that road. When one acts as a European power, the whole atmosphere tends towards ethical reflection upon one's better self and away from revisiting one's earlier oppositional posture. And then you say, such was the view of many reasonable people in 1933, just as it is the view of many reasonable people now. The mistake is to assume that rulers who come to power through institutions cannot change or destroy those very institutions, even when that is exactly what they've announced they will do. So, I mean, this is just the phrase, cautionary tale, doesn't really do this moment justice. It's just amazing to put yourself in the position of people before the Holocaust was ever known to be possible, right? Before that kind of implosion of a, a very cosmopolitan society was thinkable, before you, you, know, you, you could even dimly imagine that people would start you know, marking places of business as Jewish-owned, and that would be the precursor to your neighbors coming and seizing your property out of this kind of ecstasy of reappropriation of wealth based on tribal hatred. Anyway, talk about the defense of institutions. And again, this kind of natural myopia that people don't see that they're swimming in history. So let, let, let me start with, with, with history. So I'm, it's, I'm, I'm glad you cited that, that paragraph from, from the editorial from the Jewish newspaper for, for a number of reasons. One is that it gives me a chance to, to express my appreciation for my colleagues in the history of Nazi Germany. We just know so much about those days and weeks in 1933. And it's thanks to thousands of historians who've been working very hard on these problems for three generations now. So I didn't, you know, Sam, it's not that I knew that op-ed either. It's that it was published in a, in a very important collection of documents about the Nazi period. And w one of my points in writing the book is that confusing as the present is, we can take advantage of the clarity that we have on some moments of the past, even if that clarity is confusing to us, even if it strikes us as strange that, that people could do the things they did or think the things they thought, that's precisely the wake-up call we need because we will otherwise fall into the same ruts. So, I mean, it's interesting to me that at the beginning of your question, you use the word paranoid. If someone had told the editorial board of that newspaper, which was a Jewish newspaper, 
um, that what was going to come, they would have likely had the same reaction, that people are being paranoid. The advantage we have is that we can get some distance on our own default reactions by looking back at, at the past. The second thing I want to say is that since I wrote the book, a number of new reasons have emerged why we should take precisely 1933 seriously. Um, in the book, I say history doesn't repeat, but it does instruct. And I meant that in two senses. I mean, one sense is that we can learn um, from people and their failures and their insights. But the other is that history is instructing people who like the 1930s, who would like the 1930s to come back. Um, and unfortunately, there's more of that going on than one would like to think. If one thinks of, for example, you know, Mr. Spicer's odd appearance where he said that Hitler, you know, where he said in effect that Hitler did not kill uh, his own people, by which he meant that the handicapped and the German Jews were not actually German people. That was extraordinary. Yeah. When we think of Mr. Sessions saying that, you know, how can somebody on an island in the Pacific tell the president what to do, thereby forgetting that we, went, we, we entered the Second World War because of those islands in the Pacific. When we have Mr. Bannon saying, that the 1930s were an exciting time. When we have Mr. Trump branding our foreign policy and our energy policy, America First, when America First was precisely in its essence, um, not just a populist, but very often a white supremacist and isolationist movement, which was trying to keep us out of the Second World War. There are all kinds of references to the 1930s here, which are coming from the administration it, itself. Um, the last thing I want to say is, you know, because it's, it's, it's so striking, Sam, in your question, you said, Imagine the New York Times in 1933 publishing an editorial like this. But they did. They did. I mean, one of the reasons why the Times and the Post are so much on their toes right now is that if you look back to how the New York Times covered both Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union in the 1930s, they did not cover themselves with glory. Um, there was a huge amount of, of explaining and normalizing. In the case of both Stalin and Hitler. It's, it's very striking. So we, it's not just that Germans or German Jews tended to normalize and not see the possibilities. Our newspapers did as well. And that's, that's one more reason to be, to be cautious. Anyway, this is all kind of like the atmosphere ar ar around your question. The technical part of the question is, why are institutions important? And the answer is that we need a plurality of them. And if we don't recognize that election of somebody with authoritarian propensities is a threat to those, those institutions, they will fall. Elections had an important part in Hitler's rise to power. If we look at the authoritarian regimes around today in the 21st century, in the majority of cases, there was also an election in the story somewhere. So elections don't necessarily bring about democracy. Unfortunately, if you elect a tyrant, that tyrant is going to push against the institutions and try to pick them off one by one. And we know from the playbook of 20th century authoritarianism, whether it's from the far right or the far left, that that's the way you go. You can't take power all at once. Um, you have to pick off one thing at a time. Often it's, often it's journalism at the beginning. Often it's the high court at the beginning. But the point is that if you don't draw a line around the first institution, there's a tendency then for the dominoes to fall. You reminded me about that disastrous press conference with Sean Spicer delivering what, what I think is inadvertently one of the greatest comic masterpieces of all time when he was talking about the Holocaust centers and just flubbing his answer as badly as any beauty pageant contestant has ever flubbed her answer to why she wants to be Miss America so that she can usher in world peace or whatever it is. It was brutal. In terms of the conduct of American media during the Holocaust, yeah, I'm aware of how bad we were and how short-sighted we were. I guess I was imagining had Nazism taken hold here and we heard the same thing from the New York Times at that point, You're just kind of mapping that at that case onto our own. There's this amazing document. I think it's Better Homes and Garden. Now you, might, you may correct me here. It's one of those home magazines from the, the 30s. It was like a, just a tour of Hitler's eagle's nest, I think. And just it was just a pure puff piece of good PR for Hitler. It was well into the first years of the Thousand Year Reich and just suggests our complete delusion at the time. And I'm sorry, I want to apologize to you and, and to our listeners a little bit. We're, we're experiencing some Skype issues here with latency. So, for instance, I cannot break in on you, and you really can't break in on me. It's a little odd. So I, I want to come back to now point number three, which is beware the one-party state. The parties that remade states and suppressed rivals were not omnipotent from the start. 
they exploited a historic moment to make political life impossible for their opponents. Again, that's something that is a, a phenomenon that we can inch toward imperceptibly, I would imagine, where it's just the one party acquires more and more power and disallows more and more of the what used to be the legitimate political norms of a multi-party system. How are we functioning with respect to that particular criteria now, in your view? Yeah, I mean, th- this, is, this is part of the, the confluence of things that came together in, in 2016. It's related to Mr. Trump, but, but it's also in a way distinct. So there's, there's a story that Americans tell themselves, which is that we've had democracy for 200 years, right? And therefore, we'll just keep having democracy. Whereas really, I mean, we've, we've had democracy for a few decades since the Civil Rights Act. And in, in, in the last half of those few decades, we've been drifting away from democracy quite markedly, allowing unlimited money into politics so that, in effect, a couple of people with lots of money outside of a state can determine a state's elections is clearly not democratic. Gerrymandering, you know, to take the example of Ohio, where I'm from, where if you're a member, if you vote for one party, your vote basically counts for half of what someone else, someone else's vote for the other party counts as. The Electoral College, you know, where a voter from California has so much less weight than a voter from, let's say, Wyoming. And that's leaving aside the voter suppression laws, which are probably going to get worse. You know, my point is that we were drifting away from democracy already. Um, and, and Mr. Trump took advantage of that. I mean, obviously, in the simplest sense, he couldn't have won without the Electoral College. But in the more profound sense, the fact that people are quite rightly aware that there's too much money in politics means that he could pose as as a friendly oligarch. He could say, well, everybody knows the system is is corrupt. It's oligarchical. But I'm I'm your oligarch. And Hillary Clinton is somebody else's oligarch. You know, there are these mysterious. And this is where the global conspiracy comes in. You know, there are mysterious people behind the curtain who are behind Mrs. Clinton. But I stand before you, me, myself, Donald Trump. Um, I'm your oligarch. And of course, that wasn't true in, in many senses. I mean, it's not clear that Mr. Trump actually has that much money. Um, it's also not true that th- there were no oligarchs behind him. There were. They just weren't American citizens. But he couldn't have ridden all of that without the basic problem of there being too much money in, in, in politics. And, you know, that, that's, that's one of the issues. And a, an, another, another issue is um, the way that the, the game is now structured so that Republicans tend to win. And that creates a problem even for themselves. You know, so the, the fact that, what is it, what, 31 out of 50 state houses, I think, are Republican. The, the, the way that gerrymandering has become so surgically precise, it doesn't actually help Republicans in the long run, at least if they want to be a party in a two-party system, because it puts them in a position where they win, like this time, when they don't really have any ideas and they don't really have the policies which could help them. So, I mean, their, what are their policies now? Let's, let's warm the environment. Um, let's poison the water. Let's poison the air. Let's take away health insurance from 25 million people. And let's and let's give a lot of money to rich to the rich. OK, I mean, you can uh, it's fine if people support those policies. It's just a matter of fact that the majority of American voters don't. So the Republicans find themselves in this position of undeserved success. And then when they look out at 2018, what are they going to think exactly? And this becomes then a danger for democracy. When you have a party that controls all the levers of power and that party doesn't really have a way of democratically legitimating itself, it starts to become tempting to do other kinds of things to stay in power. And this is, again, not about Republicans or about Democrats. It's about human nature. It's about the need for checks and balances, which the founding fathers quite rightly foresaw. So we're edging into this situation, which I hope we can avoid, in which I, you know, I, I hope and trust that, that many you know, decent-minded, patriotic, constitutionally-oriented Republicans will also understand. We're edging towards a moment where one has to be really careful not to slip into a one-party situation. It's because it's, it's not just that it's unhealthy for Democrats. That's not the point. It's also unhealthy for, for Republicans. And above all, it's, you know, it leads to a situation that's very hard to get out of again. When people just get used to having power without being democratically legitimated, it's very hard to get out from under that again. You have this line from a David Lodge novel that is really poignant and beautiful. It's, you don't know when you make love for the last time that you're making love for the last time. And then you say voting is like that. Obviously, everything is like that. Generally, you don't know the last time you you are going to pick up your child, you know, because suddenly they're too large to pick up, and you now realize it's been months since you picked them up, and yeah, you know, that's just 
that is a feature of life that renders it even more precious. But there's this, the application to our, to this political situation is obviously apropos. And you say that no doubt the Russians who voted in 1990 did not think that this would be the last free and fair election in their country's history, which thus far it has been. And a little further down the page, the Russian oligarchy established after the 1990 elections continues to function and promotes a foreign policy designed to destroy democracy elsewhere. This is a generic human experience that people can take the actions, in this case democratically, that usher in the end of their democratic privileges. And they they do this without any idea that this is what's happening. I guess in other contexts they may have some idea, or a well-informed person should have some idea. You can respond to that point, but also I'd like to know in this context, what do you make of the fact that so many people on the right, I mean, really all of Trump's defenders, uh, you know, there are Republicans who don't defend him, obviously, but anyone who's defending Trump at this moment has to be perfectly sanguine or oblivious about the Russian meddling in our democracy and just the transparent attempt at this point to undermine it. This is We're talking about the party that won the Cold War, or think they did. We're talking about, if you had just gone back three years ago, you could have reasonably expected no one on earth to harbor more bias against Russia and its history of communism than the Republicans. How did we get here? So... Let me try to follow my own advice and start not with America, but start with the world. Because one of the elements of our provincialism, which is where you so nicely started the conversation, is that we we imagine that things happen here and then they roll outwards, you know, whether it's politics or economics or political theory or movies or fashion. We imagine that it happens here and then everyone else receives it. But that isn't so true anymore. And it's uh, it's it's at least it's not nearly as true as we think it is. And in some crucial respects, the reverse is really happening. In some crucial respects, the main political ideas and trends are not radiating outwards or not moving from the West to the East, but are really coming from the East to the West. Um, I'm not saying that the Russian system is stable. I don't think it is. But they have found a certain equilibrium point where you can institutionalize and stabilize radical economic inequality uh, by way of a very steady and efficiently and beautifully produced diet of fake news, complemented by a series of manufactured, um, quote unquote, triumphs abroad. This is a certain model. And bracketing for a moment the, the, the actual contacts between Russians and Trump or Trump's campaign, it's the model that we have to be aware of. We have to know that it's out there and that it's attractive to certain kinds of people. Now, that model cannot generate wealth. It can only, it can stabilize inequality. It can give reasons why there should be inequality, namely that we are in a constant struggle against the evil forces of the world. In the Russian case, those evil forces are terrorism and America. And the Russians, you know, when Trump is not looking, constantly say we're responsible for terrorism. So, but it, what it can't do is it can't generate reform because reform would take the kleptocrats out of power and it can't generate wealth. It can only justify a status quo of extreme inequality. And since, and since Russia is not alone in the world, what the Russians came to understand, or what Mr. Putin, who's a very intelligent man in many respects, came to understand, is that you have to remove the competition. You have to make the rest of the world more like Russia. If Russia is not going to be more like Europe, make Europe more like Russia. And the way to make Europe more like Russia is to support right-wing populists rhetorically, with propaganda, with money, and to support right-wing populists in the United States as well, which has been going on for some time. Um, you know, to give a kind of telling example, when Mr. Trump started talking about birtherism, Russian propaganda also started talking about birtherism way back in 2010. So they have an idea, and it's a smart idea. It's just a disaster for humanity. The idea is to bring everyone else down to Russia's level and to do so partly by supporting the far right, but also p- partly by trying to spread this idea that there's no such thing as truth, that everything is relative, that there are no facts, you know, and because in that environment, political activity and political opposition become incoherent and impossible. They succeeded that at home, and now they've been trying to spread that abroad. And they've done so with some success. And one has to recognize their intelligence, and one has to be clear about their, their aims. Because 
we are now in the middle of that. What's happening to us has, has been much more a result of intelligent Russians acting intelligently according to what they see as their own interests than it has been a result of our figuring out what's actually going on. When it comes to, so now to get to your question, I mean, when it comes to Republicans in Russia, first of all, one has to accept that there are plenty of people who do see Russia as a positive model. It's not just Richard Spencer, you know, who, who talks about how Russia is a positive model. There are plenty of evangelical Christians who perhaps more quietly um, regard Russia's stand against what they see as an Islamic problem. And they regard what they see as Russia's embrace of orthodoxy as a positive model. What they see as Russia's uh, appropriate line about homosexuality as positive. There's been a fair amount of circulation of ideas in people um, through Moscow and back through the American heartland. So there are plenty of there are plenty of people who see Russia as quite properly the leader of a right wing movement. And, and this also addresses what you say about the Cold War. I mean, you and I might still think about the Cold War when we think of Russia, but the modern the, the American right really no longer does. The American right looks at Russia and they see what they think is a model of an anti-terrorist, you know, religion loving uh, leadership. That, of course, is all just complete hogwash you know, manufactured for abroad. It's just as bogus as the image of the Soviet Union in the 1930s that attracted elements of the American left. In many ways, it's very similar. Now, in fact, Russia is a very poor country where people are not free, where basically nobody goes to church um, and where, you know, the, the number two or number three person in the country is himself a Muslim terrorist, right? So it's, it's not what people on the American right think it is, but nevertheless, they have, they have bought into that image. And it's partly a result of their traveling to Russia, um, it's partly res and it's partly a result of Russian propaganda. So, I mean, we have to accept that in some sense, you know, the people on the American right are correct. If you want an authority, if you want a kind of kleptocratic, extremely unequal, authoritarian, nominally, though not really Christian regime, then they can see Russia as a positive model. That makes that makes a certain kind of sense. Now, if that's not you, if you don't have those ideas and you still think the Russian meddling is not an issue, then there are just some there's some factual issues here. And I mean, at, at a different I mean, so I think there are plenty of people who are Trump supporters or Republicans who think the Trump thing, who think the Russia thing, um, or as Mr. Trump puts it, the Russia and Trump and Russia and Trump thing. If you think it's not real, um, I think that's probably an information siloing problem, because if you follow even the Russian press, which is where I started, I mean, I, I broke this story uh, well over a year ago, writing from Russian sources, because it was quite clear from open Russian sources that the Russian political and media elites were siding with Mr. Trump. Not it wasn't even the general election then. It was during the primaries. They were already siding with Mr. Trump. Um, and then there were a whole series of revelations over the course of 2016, which everyone should know. Right. Everyone should know that uh, the first foreign policy speech was written by somebody on the Russian payroll, that the first Russian adv Russia advisor of Mr. Trump was on the Russian payroll. That, that Mr. Flynn, who was, who was the advisor for security affairs, and then briefly, actually, the national security advisor, was on the payroll of a Russian propaganda outlet. That Paul Manafort, who was the campaign manager, was not paid by Mr. Trump, but that he was someone who had offered up to Mr. Putin the possibility of softening up American do democracy for Russian influence. These are all things that are publicly known, right? It's also publicly known that Mr. Kushner had to lie about his contacts with Russia in order to get security clearance. It's publicly known that Mr. Sessions had to lie about his contacts with the Russians in order to, you know, he perjured himself at his own confirmation hearings to become the, the most important law official in the land, which is just absurd and grotesque. Um, these things are all publicly known. They're not denied. They're, they're in the record. So I think that there's also this question of the siloing off of information where people, some people think, OK, Russia connection, bad for Trump, therefore must be manufactured by his enemies. And th that's a way of thinking which is dangerous and anti-democratic. I mean, if we're citizens, we all have to confront the facts as they are and, and welcome an investigation because if there was no collusion, then, then fine, then, then everything, then okay, then there was no collusion. If there was collusion, it benefits us all to, to, to know about it. Yeah, well, the siloing of information is this, an enormous problem, which I've been speaking about more and more, and I, we'll, we'll get to it more because I, I want to talk about the hostility to facts, which is, I think it's your point 10, which is crucial and cuts through all of this. But the siloing of information is this enormous problem, which we're going to spend the rest of our lives grappling with. But of course, everyone who's just heard what you said about the current situation and about Russia's influence, who doesn't believe any of that, will just view what you said as a symptom of your own siloing. You've been taken in 
by fake news. You read the fake news at the Washington Post and the New York Times and whatever your Russian language sources are, and you have you know, you have been bamboozled the way you are claiming other people are bamboozled by their echo chamber of Breitbart and Fox and all the rest. And, and that's a bit of a stalemate. Obviously, you and I, there's no parity between the two sides in our view. So we, you know, we re- return that favor. And we, neither of us will lose sleep tonight wondering whether we, we're generally right to trust the Washington Post and the New York Times and the Atlantic more than our opponents or critics are generally right to trust Breitbart and Fox. But this siloing problem, this, this allegation of siloing goes both ways, and it, is, it does make these particular conversations almost impossible to have across the sides. Is there anything you want to say about that? Yeah, there's something really basic I want to say about that. It has to do with whether we actually accept facts or not. It, it's one thing to say, I know fact A and you know fact B. It's another thing when the, your leaders are trying to teach you to be suspicious of facts as such, which is, I'm afraid, where we are now. So when, when, when Ms. Conway tells us that we have alternative facts or when the president says that journalists are the enemies of the people, when Mr. Bandon says that the journalists are an opposition party, what we have is not one set of facts and another set of facts which can mutually enrich. What we have are people who are actually trying to instruct Americans to be ignorant in a committed way. And that's the language of authoritarianism. And we should just face that that's the way authoritarianism works. And authoritarianism is attractive for that reason. It's more comfortable to hear the things that you want to hear over and over. Now, I mean, I, you know, Keynes, Keynes put it very nicely. When the facts change, I change my mind. You know, what do you do, sir? That's my view, too. I, my, my views about Russia and Trump could be changed by a preponderance of evidence on the other side. Thus far, there is no, no such evidence. And we keep, you know, the evidence that we have, including, you know, right down to the fact that the president keeps trying to cancel the investigation, um, very, which is, in my view, basically a confession. I mean, let's face it, if we saw an individual behave that way in some other sphere of life, we'd say, wow, that person is clearly guilty. But if the facts change, I'm happy to change, I'm happy to change my mind. And it seems to me that that's the basic, that's the basic issue. Are we actually open to facts? Can we actually change our, change our minds? So, you know, that's, that's, that's where I stand. If there's a lot of evidence on the other side, I will, I will, I will change my mind. It happens to be the case that I, I do read Russian and I do read Ukrainian. And I know a lot of people, you know, who are fairly close to these events. Personally, I spent time in the countries. I've watched these things unfold. Um, the name Paul Manafort has been familiar to me for a very long time. The whole cast of characters who are now appearing in American news are people that I've been reading about for, you know, years or even decades. So I think I have some sense of the larger, larger patterns. I think I'm pretty well informed, but I'm happy to yield to someone who's, who's better informed. And above all, what I want is an investigation. So, I mean, if, like if, if you are, if you don't want an investigation, why not? Um, it, it seems like nothing, no harm can come of the investigation. If Mr. Trump is innocent, then, you know, if Mueller produces a wonderful investigation, which shows that Mr. Trump is innocent, that's fine. That means all we have is a big intelligence problem because a foreign power was able to intervene in our elections. It, it, but if he produces facts in the other direction that show that Mr. Trump is guilty, then I think we all should all be willing to recognize that. But if you're hostile to an investigation, then for me, I mean, the question is why? You know, the whole point of investigating is to figure things out. Yeah, well, I would extend that to why not release Trump's tax returns? I'm pretty sure I know why Trump doesn't want to release them, but because as you say, he's, he was almost certainly not as wealthy as he claimed and was probably largely indebted to the Russians, neither of which is a crime, but all of that's politically inconvenient. But the question is, why would a defender of Trump actually not want him to release his tax returns? If you think he's not this con man of a sort that we've scarcely ever seen, who's lying about everything, why wouldn't you, then, then what's the harm in having him release his tax returns? The burden is on you to explain why you think that would be a bad idea when every candidate in recent decades has done that. I think we should just jump to lesson 10 here, 
because it's just it's of a piece with what you just said, and then I'll go back and touch lesson four. But lesson ten is believe in truth. To abandon facts is to abandon freedom. If nothing is true, then no one can criticize power, because there is no basis upon which to do so. If nothing is true, then all is spectacle. The biggest wallet pays for the most blinding lights. That's really what has been so animating to me and infuriating more than anything else has been this assault on truth, this eroding of the norms of civil conversation where when something is as plain as day, you're forced to acknowledge it. You're forced to acknowledge it by the press. There is personal shame associated with failing to acknowledge it. There are reputational costs. No one listens to you ever again if you are sufficiently out of register with what is true and, and, and deny it. We seem to have crossed over into some new place where someone like Kellyanne Conway or you know Sean Spicer can endlessly get on television and confabulate. And to its credit, the media has become less and less patient with this. And so you've had, you've had these delightful moments where journalists have pressed both of these people in ways that people on the other side would no doubt think is a sign of media bias and, and lack civility. But the, I mean, the time for civility has long passed with respect to characters like Spicer and Conway. I mean, it's just unbelievable how they attempt to euphemize and lie outright So this is, let's talk about this. I'm just going to read a little bit more of your language here. You submit to tyranny when you renounce the difference between what you want to hear and what is actually the case. This renunciation of reality can feel natural and pleasant, but the result is your demise as an individual, and thus the collapse of any political system that depends upon individualism. And then you you, uh, reference this Victor Klemperer, who uh, talked about how truth dies in four modes, and The first mode, back to your text, the first mode is the open hostility to verifiable reality, which takes the form of presenting inventions and lies as if they were facts. The president does this at a high rate and at a fast pace. One attempt during the 2016 campaign to track his utterances found that 78% of his factual claims were false. This proportion is so high that it makes the correct assertions seem like unintended oversights on the path toward total fiction. Demeaning the world as it is begins the creation of a fictional counterworld. So the assault on truth, I think, is more fundamental to authoritarian regime change than we sometimes realize. And, and that's because if we do read histories of communism or histories of fascism, the words we're reading are, are produced by historians who naturally are functioning in a kind of reasonable, factual mode. And it's very hard to recall you know, the poetry, the magic of of the ideology uh, as it functioned in the time. And that's why in my book, I'm very careful to cite people who experienced national socialism or fascism or communism and their own recollection of their own contemporaneous uh, experience of propaganda so that we have a sense of how people are, are vulnerable and how the propaganda works. Propaganda isn't just, it's not It's not just a kind of muddling of reality or meddling reality. Propaganda basically works by trying to replace our own individual apprehension of facts with something else. So the fascist said, it's not what you think or or you feel or you think you know that's important. The only truth is whether or not you feel subjectively, spiritually part of a larger national community. And if you do, wonderful. And if you don't, then you're an enemy. And the, the communist said, the only truth is the vision of the beautiful utopian socialist future. Therefore, what, what seems to be happening today is not important. Today is only important insofar as it leads to that future. Therefore, it's not only justified, but actually required that we lie about things happening today because that's going to help us get to that future. The, the difference in the 21st century is that the people who are trying to bring about authoritarian regime changes don't have the same kinds of grand, vic- grand visions. Their attack on truth is entirely negative, but nevertheless, it's really effective. And what I'm, going to, what I'm about to describe has happened in Russia, and it's happening in the U.S. We're all, we're all vulnerable to it. First step is what Mr. Trump did in 2016, and you've already described it. You fill the public sphere with things that aren't true, and you contradict yourself all the time, not just for your own convenience, but because you're actually you're going after the notion of, of truthful discussion. Then step two 
you blame the people who are actually responsible for factuality. You you call the journalists you you call the journalists enemies or opponents. Um, you you talk about how you're going to discipline them, crack down on them, and so on. Um, you you blame everything on on them. And then the third step, if you win, is that then nobody knows what truth is anymore. Nobody trusts the authority of journalists, and you yourself end up having a monopoly or at least the strongest position in the manufacture of the day of the symbols of the day. That's you know that that's clearly what they're up to. And I think it's it's probably more central and more uh, more important than we generally realize, because it, democ- you know when, no one can say where we're going, but we can say what democracy requires. Democracy requires the rule of law. The rule of law requires trust, and trust requires that we all think that there are facts out there. If you can if you can do away with that belief that there are facts out there, then you've gone straight to the heart of the matter, and you've well you've re- you've destroyed democracy. That's the, that's the cheap and easy way to do it. And that's what the 21st century authoritarians have discovered. And that's the process which is underway um, before our eyes. Now I'm just jumping around with impunity here because what you just said connects to the ninth lesson, which is be kind to our language. Avoid pronouncing the phrases everyone else does. Think up your own way of speaking, even if only to convey the thing you think everyone is saying. Make an effort to separate yourself from the internet. Read books. And uh, you say something very relevant in that chapter to the way the press has inadvertently or not normalized Trump. So you say, politicians in our times feed their cliches to television, where even those who wish to disagree repeat them. Television purports to challenge political language by conveying images, but the succession from one frame to another can hinder a sense of resolution. Everything happens fast, but nothing actually happens. Each story on television is breaking until it is displaced by the next one. So we are hit by wave upon wave, but never see the ocean. There's something in there that I'm aware has been bothering me, but I really haven't thought about it in those terms, which is we are hostage to the news cycle in a way that, I guess this connects with something I've I've often said on this podcast, which is if Trump were one-tenth as bad he would seem much worse. It's like that the velocity of the lying and the scandal and the conflicts of interest, the fact that there's just something new to absorb every four hours, it seems, puts the, the news cycle in this perpetual spin where just you, you, don't even have, you don't have time to absorb the significance of what just happened because four hours later, something new will be in the news. And the way in which, I guess this is especially true of television, The way in which journalists are forced to try to interact with the people in power to get their defense or explanation for what's going on causes them to normalize the quite crazy terms that are spewing from these people in power. Again, this often happens even in the mode where they're seeming to be critical they are adopting the language that is already distorting our perception of of what is politically normal. Yeah, th- this is this is one of the reasons why I'm I'm so careful with language in the book and why the formulations in the book I think will, will often seem different than the kinds of formulations one would find on television or or even in newspapers because I'm trying really hard on the basis of the things that I think I know to to conceptualize the present and I I think that we we can all do it. I'm I'm now going to put a more optimistic spin on on your question because I agree with all your premises. We, we're not really trapped by all this though. We we act like we are, but we're not really trapped by it. We can decide that we're only going to watch news on television for you know half an hour a day or a couple of hours a week and and schedule it rather than getting lost in it. Likewise with the internet, we can decide that we're going to spend you know half an hour a day and, and schedule it rather than just getting drawn in. The, the truth is that we don't actually gain anything by watching more. Um, we can, you know, you, you, if you want to know the news, reading a good newspaper and, and, you know, by the way, subscribing to it for half an hour a day is going to be better than watching television or clicking on the internet for three or four hours a day. We can, we can do that. We just have to have, we have to say, okay, this, this matters to me. I'm going to discipline myself a little bit because I want to be a free person. And that also clears up the time for, for reading and for speaking with with other people. So in order, I mean, it's not, I'm not telling people what to think. I, I'm just, what I'm trying to remind us all of is that 
the, the smart critics of authoritarianism, and this goes all the way through the 1970s and 80s and through our own history of being a country that was once against fascism and once against communism, um, at least in big parts of its elites, we once had all these concepts and we had these concepts in part because we were reading books, but also in part because just general reading, just the ability to bring to bear, to bring to bear constructs, to bring to bear phrases that, that might apply to something which has struck you. Because when something happens, you can react one of one of two ways. You can react in terms of the the the, own, the, the mental preparation you've made yourself, or you can react in the, according to the way people want you to react. And the, you know, even though this administration is in many ways incompetent, um, and we can laugh at it sometimes in its messaging, as we say, nevertheless, they have their way that they want us to follow. And many people, many people do just follow. But I guess the, the fundamental thing that I would want to track here, it would be freedom. We're not really free unless we can put our own words on subjects. And unless we can put our own words on subjects, we also can't really talk to other people. Because if we speak the words of the internet that we look at or the television we watch, the other people will recognize that because in the internet they look at or the TV they watch, those are the very words and phrases that are being criticized. If we can find some other way to frame our concerns, then we might evoke in the minds of others some associations which go beyond what they were just watching. So the, the reading is also a precondition to the conversation. I think the conversation is also something that we very much need politically. Now we're coming up on over an hour. I'm mindful of your time, Timothy. So I think I'll take one more chapter here, which is chapter four. Take responsibility for the face of the world. The symbols of today enable the reality of tomorrow. Notice the swastikas and other signs of hate. Do not look away and do not get used to them. Remove them yourself and set an example for others to do so. And then you, you start this chapter saying, Life is political not because the world cares about how you feel, but because the world reacts to what you do. The minor choices we make are themselves a kind of vote, making it more or less likely that free and fair elections will be held in the future. And then you go on to talk about something that Vaclav Havel wrote in the, the Power of the Powerless. And he was pointing out that, and this is back to your text, the continuity of an oppressive regime in whose goals and ideology few people still believed can be maintained. And now, now back to your text. He offered a parable of a green grocer who places a sign reading, Workers of the World Unite in his shop window. It is not that the man actually endorses the content of this quotation from the Communist Manifesto. He places the sign in his window so that he can withdraw into daily life without trouble from the authorities. When everyone else follows the same logic, the public sphere is covered with signs of loyalty and resistance becomes unthinkable. It's that withdrawal into daily life that is interesting to me. You know, and I think people feel it on both sides here. I mean, people who would never, at least at this stage, post or utter any sign of loyalty still find it in certain cases too painful to express any dissent or too risky socially or it's just not worth the hassle what's the point of going public with one's feelings on this maybe i'll talk about the the, the risks and the rewards by by returning to um some of the some of the remarks you made at the beginning of the conversation where you were trying to, you know, gather in listeners who, who might find the direction of this conversation to be too extreme. I just want to stress that in the connections that I'm making, I'm, I'm being instructed not just historically, but also personally by people who have lived through these kinds of, of regimes. And it's, it's, that, that, it's not just the, the, the knowledge or the appreciation of the generosity of the political theorists whom I'm citing, it, it's also um, the contiguity, the personal contiguity, which makes this all seem real to me. So, I mean, just before I started talking to you, I was returning an email from a woman who was the daughter of a, a German Holocaust survivor and who talked about how her mother, um, before she died, her mother forgave her German friends for their embrace of unfreedom. You know, so she she watched it happen. She she was she she fled as a girl. Her family fled. She survived, but she remembered this 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 process. Or you know, there's a there was a Polish Holocaust survivor who I know, or I should say, knew who 
had a wonderful career in in literature and was still was writing up to the very end, um, but who suffered from cancer. And when Trump won, decided to no longer treat the cancer. In other words, she decided to die. She didn't want to see it happen. So, I mean, those are just two examples of an awful lot of communication that happens, still happens between me and other people who work on those parts of the world and and earlier generations. Um, Havel was also somebody who, at the end of his life, I, I knew. Um, and so it's not just that I appreciate his wisdom. It's also that his presence in my life and in the life of so many others reminds us that this happens to people like us. We're learning from these people because they're people like us. Things, nothing ever repeats, but similar things can happen. And it's not at all clear that we're as wise as, as someone like Havel. The, the, the fundamental point in lesson number four about um, the face of the world and also in a number of the other point, the other, the other lessons, like um, the one about small talk, has to do with everyday power. What Havel is saying is a bit like what we were talking about before with lesson one. Each, it's, it's precise, ironically, it's precisely when we're facing incipient or weak authoritarianism that we actually have more power than we do at other times because gestures and words and handshakes um, count for very much more. They count in terms of our own psychological alignment um, of ourselves as free people. They count in their affirmation and their encouragement of people who might feel marginalized. We don't know who these people are, but if we affirm everybody, then we know people are going to feel better. And it also, and we also are able to change the general atmosphere. You know, so for people who think, yeah, this is bad, but I don't want to take the risk. I mean, I guess the, the, the fundamental thing is most of these things are pretty small. And you really don't change, take very many risks by marching or by subscribing to a newspaper um, or by running for local office or by giving to a non-governmental organization. Or at least at this particular moment, the risks that we're running are so small compared to others who have gone before us and who have so generously left for us all of this wonderful writing. You know, that's one of the things I was struck by writing this book. People like Victor Klemperer or Hannah Arendt, they weren't writing for themselves. They were writing because they knew people later on would face similar challenges. We have what they've left us, and all we really have to do is is use it. And then the other thing I would say, maybe it's the last thing about the risks, you know, all these things, the 20 lessons, they're basically good for you anyway. You know, like even if I'm, if, if, if I'm completely wrong about Trump and, you know, it turns out that he's in the middle of writing a treatise about the 14th Amendment, you know, we've got them all wrong. Even if I am completely mistaken, these are these are daily practices that are just good for civil society in general, regardless of your political convictions. But let's say that there's some chance that I'm right or basically right. There's some chance that 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 we could lose the kinds of freedoms that many Americans are used to taking for granted. That's the risk, right? That's that's the risk, the risk that children and grandchildren will not know what it is like to be free. That's the risk, you know, that, that the coming tens and hundreds of millions of Americans will not know what it's like to be in a free country. We'll just not know what we're talking about when we talk about freedom, because that's what happens. I mean, freedom is not like, it's not like cake. It's not like it's there or not there. You know, when it's gone, the way that it's gone is that you people no longer know what it is. And then you have a real struggle to get it back. I see so much in the United States now, which tends towards people forgetting, it, forgetting what it is. Um, and, and that's what I worry about. It seems to me that's the risk, which is so much greater than the risk that we might face by whatever talking to a stranger sometime. Well, that's a great place to leave it, Timothy. I can't tell you how much I enjoyed this conversation and your book. It's just you have a, a very unique voice and you are speaking at the right time. So uh, please keep it up. And, and I look forward to, to speaking again with you on the podcast. It's really been my pleasure. And I appreciate your preparation and, and all of your work. And I'm really glad that we had the chance to do this. And I hope that we can talk again, um, you know, whether in this, in this form or, or in person, I hope in person. Yeah, no doubt. Okay, well, take care, Timothy. You too. Thanks a lot. If you find these conversations valuable, there are many ways you can support this podcast. You can leave reviews on iTunes or anywhere else the show appears. You can tell your friends about it or link to it on social media. Or you can sponsor the podcast directly through my website. 